if we want to give our kids the best shot in life, it, you know, you want to look at yeah. religious traditions that have favorable outcomes. It's doing something quite cruel to a kid to be putting them and raising them in a new cultural group that you have created yourself and raise them feeling like you won't appreciate them if they do anything other than this really insane, weird thing you set up for them. And a lot mm. of people, when we present our cultural group, they're like, why? don't you just go to our group, right? Like, this is what we constantly hear. They're like, our group is traditional. Our group has done this a long time. And the answer is likely, and I don't mean to say this harshly, but it's probably because your group is failing. Would you like to know more? Hello, Simone. Today, we are going to talk about a fairly interesting and nuanced topic. Yeah. Which is this year, one of the things we did is we celebrated Hanukkah as a family for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people are really surprised by the fact that we raise our kids with the option to be Jewish. And they're like, what, why would you do that? Well, like, why would you think you'd be accepted? Like, this is a weird thing to do, <laughs> especially given all of your religious beliefs. So this requires much enumeration on our part. Yeah. Um, at the end of this video, I'll play the little, you know, menorah lighting with the kids and everything. They were really into it this year. Yeah, um, I'm sure we did it extremely wrong but i will say that our oldest son octavian got super into it and we don't know how like we let them watch stuff on their ipads for like a little bit every night well not ipads actually really cheap android devices but they don't know the difference we call them ipads they don't know the difference <laughs> well no uh, torsten calls them his hapas thank you very much hapas. Which I think is so cute. Hapas. <laughs> oh god so he, uh, uh, they're under but anyway years. somehow and we don't know how our son octavian like found a bunch of and he's four years old videos on youtube about hanukkah for kids and he just was like watching them on repeat and then each night he was like oh like let's let's do it let's let's light the menorah and then like after it was over there were like at least three nights of great disappointment when there were no more candles to light we didn't even and do I, presents or anything we just did the readings no yeah um, no yeah like we he'd always say after a reading he'd go mom what does that even mean? What does that even mean? Yeah, but except that every time I would like finish, I, I would finish part of like the, the recital, like both the kids would be like, yeah. Like after each, you know, like, you know, so, you know, the Lord encourages us to like light the menorah and the Lord performed these miracles. And they're like, yeah, but they have no idea. No idea what it actually meant. But anyway, so like they were so, actually so really first into of all, it. Why are we doing this? Right. Yes. Like, like one is, so there's, there's sort of two large strategic reasons for doing this. We believe really heavily that one of the big problems with a lot of conservative tradition families today is that they raise their kids believing that the, the alternative to following the culture that they are outlining for the kids is the urban monoculture. And this is that so that underrated. Is the only and default alternative. Whereas we are trying to raise our kids with a choice between two conservative extremes where they feel that the alternative in the way that they are raised to be sort of intergenerational in the way they think about things is going to be the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So one is why do we think we'd be accepted by that community in terms of how we do this? Well, the answer is actually pretty interesting and unique to us. And I've mentioned this on other things is that we found out I, well, maybe a bit before we first met each other, but I certainly didn't know it until after we were dating, is that Simone is matrilineally Jewish. <clears throat> and within conservative Jewish communities, that makes her and our kids, so I would say technically Jewish, whereas to them it's just fully Jewish. Yeah, whenever we, we say to like at least some Jewish people that like, oh, yeah, we're technically Jewish, they're like, what do you mean? And then we're like, well, yeah, our kids are matrilineally Jewish. Jewish and they're like, no, no, no. So they're Jewish. And we're like, I mean, like, I, we, I don't feel like we deserve it. like cheating if you're from any other cultural group. Yeah. So also, we did not know until like maybe a couple of years ago. And no, like two years ago. Yeah. A couple of years ago that, that literally like that was the requirement. We thought that there were, we heard, you know, about like, you know, people trying to convert your, your yeah. sister tried to convert, you know, turned away multiple times, like a ton of like studying and work. And so we're like, well, okay. So, I mean, to be Jewish, then you have to put in a ton of work and at least like even for like non hard to convert to religions good religions that like if we you know in 30 seconds wanted to convert we could be welcomed with open arms 
you're still really not considered that like a part of that religion, unless you're like leaning into it, you identify with it, you signal, you go to church, you know, or at least you say certain things. And we hadn't done any of that. So it felt really weird. And it's a very weird technicality. But, but it's it also it like an option to us. So yeah. when we are raising kids within our weird religion and cultural framework, if we are preventing or if we are presenting one other backup for them to turn to the, the, other than our weird version of Christianity, you know, mm -hmm. what is that backup going to be? And a lot mm -hmm. of people, when we present our cultural group, they're like, why don't you just go to our group? right? Like this is what we constantly hear. They're like, our group is traditional. Our group has done this a long time. And the answer is likely, and I don't mean to say this harshly, but it's probably because your group is failing. If I could choose what cultural group my kids go in and Jew is an option, let's just like look at what the other alternatives are hmm. now before we go into this it's important to remember that we are not arguing against the truth of these religious systems we believe that every one of the religious systems i mean this is why we are considering them is true from the perspective of a tesseract god but and this is a concept we go into in another video where we believe that trying to fall the conservative revelation of specific Judeo-Christian religious traditions, which are direct revelations from God, is God's will for certain groups of people. So when we're choosing between these traditions, what we are choosing is the one that most realistically, if we had as a backup for our kids, we think that kids would choose that over the urban monoculture if they do not choose the tradition that we are raising them in. So that means that these are the traditions that we can most logically convince somebody of our cultural group to join. That said, a lot of people will look at this and they're like, oh, well, this is too analytical a way to approach religion. You know, can't you just approach religion with faith? Uh, when you are choosing between religious traditions, saying just have faith doesn't work. Just have faith only works when you are choosing between a religious tradition and no religious tradition, or a religious tradition and a weaker, less conservative iteration of that religious tradition. Because you can have faith in any individual religious tradition. And then an individual might say, well, just pray to God and have him tell you which one is the correct answer. And then the problem is, yeah, but people of all of these traditions have already done that, and clearly God has returned to them that their tradition is the correct. And if he didn't return that answer to them, then there's somebody like Joseph Smith or something, and then everyone will say, oh, he started a cult, you know? Which, you know, you could say that that's what we've done. In our way, we prayed to God, said, what's the correct answer? And he gave us this really weird answer. So, I, I don't think that, that that is effective to us either. So keep in mind, there is a reason why we are approaching this logically. It is because we care for the fate of our children's soul, and we need to choose a tradition that we think is one both true, but also is easy to logically argue to our kids that they should choose if they don't choose our own. I could go for a conservative Catholic group. The average fertility rate in a majority Catholic country in Europe right now is 1.3. It is mm. desperately low. Nope. And 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 culturally, it just is is probably the biggest mismatch with us possible in terms of our extremely anti-authority mindset. And 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 to keep in mind, when we point out how like distant we are. If, if you look at like my my family background, like I'm a direct descendant of Oliver Cromwell, like very very far from that cultural group. Yeah. Um, now, before I go further with this, I need to really clearly say that this is not me arguing against Catholicism as a true representation of God within this Tesseract God framework. I am simply going over why I personally could not get behind it, and I do not think it would be a good system for me to raise as a backup system for my own children. Also, logically, I have trouble with Catholicism versus other Christian traditions. Specifically, it differentiates itself by saying, we have this system for choosing the one individual who is the key representative of God on earth, the Pope. However, I brought up the Cadaver Synod flippantly earlier, and I really don't take it flippantly when I'm looking at Catholicism from a logical consistency standpoint. In this incident, one pope dug up the body of another dead pope, his predecessor, put him on trial, saying that he was both immoral and that the system had inaccurately put him in the papacy, and then threw his body in the river. Then, after that pope was assassinated by his own clergy, 
he then had his own actions repudiated by the next pope. So this is not like me as an outsider saying by whatever outside moral standards I have that the papacy has been a bad system at choosing God's core representative on earth. It is God's core representative on earth as chosen by this system saying it's a bad system for choosing God's core representative on earth. I just can't logically get around that. Now, of course, the standard Catholic response to this is none of this situation happened ex cathedra. So ex cathedra is a special set of circumstances that's required for something a pope says or writes to be considered the direct word of God or directly inspired by God. The problem I have with this counter is that ex cathedra was not a concept when this trial was happening. Ex cathedra as a concept was not fully delineated until almost a millennium after this trial at the First Vatican Council. So when the Great Schism happened, in which the Patriarch of Rome claimed that his system for, for choosing a patriarch was innately and, and categorically superior to the systems all of the other patriarchs were using, and he then excommunicated some of these other patriarchs, potentially damning their souls to hell, he was doing that with all of the power invested in him that was invested in the popes during the cadaver syndrome, which was before ex cathedra had been developed. And keep in mind, ex cathedra was developed with all of these events in mind. This would be like saying, oh, me as an investor, my investment decisions are ordained by God. You can see by how good they've turned out. And then somebody comes to me and they're like, look, you've objectively lost tons of money on the stock market. And then I go, oh, no, 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 no. You see, it turns out that all of the decisions I made on Tuesdays and Wednesdays don't count. Now, I am making this carve out after knowing that those days were my bad trading days. That is not a compelling argument for this being a good system or for me being a good trader. However, this ex cathedra argument, which again, we don't think is very compelling, did not even exist during the time of the Great Schism as a concept, where it had to differentiate its system as being innately superior to the Orthodox system. And this then comes to another problem, which is all of the events of the Cadaver Synod had actually happened fairly recently before the Great Schism. So when the Patriarch of Rome is telling all of the other patriarchs, my system is innately superior to all of your systems, recently within their memory is the Cadaver Synod. And I mean, look, God actually intended us to use this system to choose his representative on Earth, then he would not have allowed this to happen. However, if he was trying to tell us, don't choose this system, choose another, and God wanted to send a very loud signal to anyone who was investigating it that it is not his voice on Earth, this seems like the way he would have signaled something like that. In addition to that, though, and as we've talked about before, aesthetically, Catholicism does not seem to be a representation of the true word of God as laid out in the Christian Bible, as I understand it. Which one is it? You must choose. But choose wisely. For as the true grail will bring you life, the false grail will take it from you. I'm not a historian. I have no idea what it looks like. Which one is it? Let me choose. Oh, yes. Certainly is the cup of the King of Kings. Eternal life. What is happening to me? He chose poorly. It would not be made out of gold. That's the cup of a carpenter. So, when coming at this choice of what system would be a good backup system for my own kids, Catholicism is the one I can easily rule out. Like, it seems like the obviously wrong choice. 
Hello, Drew. Um, but that doesn't mean that it is the wrong choice for other people. So, for example, Catholicism might be a uniquely good and powerful system for any family that is really moved by ritual and really moved by grandeur and really moved by authority instead of repelled by things like ritual and grandeur. You could go with Orthodox. I, I think that Orthodox is the original Christianity. I think the Orthodox gr groups of Christians are the original Christianity. If you're like, I want to be original OG Christian. Like higher fidelity to the... Higher fidelity to the original church. And we can do another video on this because a lot of people think that's the Catholics and it really isn't the Catholics, mm. it's the Orthodox. But because, I mean, in, in, in the early days, if you look at the early church, if you look at the church writings, it was a group of heads of various cities who would meet with each other and were broadly equals. The idea of one person being above all the others really only came into play when Rome like really began to dominate the 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 political scene. And then, you know, after Constantine made it the Roman Empire, they were like, okay, this one city is more important than the other cities, but that doesn't really flow is like the original intentionality of the church hmm. so they they have the most claim but i have no cultural connection to them like none it would be so weird to convert to orthodox christianity we have no genetic connection no cultural connection and well um, i mean technically my jewish ancestors converted to orthodox christianity because they were renting their upper apartment to the ss <laughs> Okay, so that's how they hit it yeah so we do have a family connection but that's yeah not nothing realistic yeah we also run into the same aesthetic problem that we've run into with catholicism when we're dealing with the orthodox traditions for context here Vladimir I of Kievan Rus, the guy who basically sort of founded the Russian Orthodox Church he chose orthodoxism over other iterations of Christianity because he was so impressed with how beautiful the Hagia Sophia was, or at least that's the legend. In the same vein, I also think I would have a hard time if I had to try to convince my kids to believe that there was any sort of theological import to things like relics, which from my tradition was in Christianity and my beliefs around iconoclasm, that's basically worshipping a corpse someone took a bedazzler to. Introducing the Bedazzler. Transform your ordinary blue jeans into an expensive designer look. Be the envy of your friends. Be creative. Bedazzle your socks. Mitts and gloves. Hats and scarves. So then the Protestant groups, right? Like, I like the Protestant groups. I see them as broadly right. If you believe that the Bible is the only and total revelation, but, you know, obviously we've talked about on other podcasts, we don't believe that. We don't even believe that the Bible really states that it, it notes that there's going to be future revelations. And so the advantage of things like the Orthodox tradition and the Catholic tradition is they have systems in place that allow adherence to those traditions to easily identify how God's word is elucidated upon or added to with additional prophets because they have these central hierarchies which allow them to say this is an accurate prophet, this is an inaccurate prophet, and through that the tradition can evolve with God's continuing revelation. And as to why we believe God has a continuing revelation, it's because that's what the Bible says. It, Jesus says there are going to be prophets after me. Uh, whereas within Protestantism, you have no system for doing that, or within the traditional Protestant faith, uh, which means you're sort of frozen in time at the point when the Bible was written, which to me seems incongruous was what I think God would want. Like, I don't think God would have given his whole and complete revelation to uh, an obscure group 2,000 years ago and that that message wouldn't reach a huge portion of the world's population for like a thousand years after it was delivered. So to me, I think God has always been trying to as holistically as he can reveal himself in the way that every group is meant to understand him. But that being the case, it means that we have no system if we go as a traditional Protestant strand of determining these additional revelations. And since our family's existing faith is essentially Protestant plus additional revelations, there is no advantage to having a traditional form of Protestantism as a backup to it that stuff is already encompassed in what we teach our children. Like, so, so when we're looking at things and, and it offers us no advantage, like 
if if you look at the Protestant cultural groups in the world today, they are some of the most underperforming of the Christian cultural group. Yeah, and like what cultural amenities are they offering? Like at least Mormons have like this amazing community and lifestyle and, you know, all that. Yes. And then people will say things like, well, then why don't you go back to your ancestral tradition, you know, the Calvinist tradition? And that's because the Calvinist group that exists within any population today in America is almost the antithesis of the historical Calvinist group. You know, they're evangelical hardliners like Ayla's dad, for example, which doesn't lead to good outcomes in today's society. Whereas you look at the iteration of the Calvinist group that is our actual cultural group. It's the one that Scott Alexander slash Star Slate Codex wrote about when he wrote the Puritan Spotting Checklist. And, and we would almost appear to be an offensive stereotype of this group, you know, for the things he gives points for. Atheist DS Freethinker wrote a book about their heterodox religious views, invented a new religion, invented a new Christian heresy, obsessed with religious tolerance, founded their own school, had really weird names, had a bunch of kids, wrote a list of virtues, had a plan to amenitize the Eshtaton, social reformer, waged a crusade against an abstract concept, ideals that were utopian yet racist, and I don't think our views are racist, but we get accused of racism all the time, abolitionist, my family famously very involved in the abolition movement and fighting for uh, African American rights, famously involved in philanthropy, we were also involved in the prohibition movement, I love it, rabidly anti-war, yet rabidly supports every specific war that happened. So you can see that, like, this is clearly the group we're from. We're not even acting out of line with this group's cultural traditions. And yet they have no community for us to go back to. And even what we're doing with the religion we're creating for our family is very much something somebody from this group would do. So we haven't left this group in terms of our primary religious system. The core real choices for us to raise as an alternative for our kids are Jews and Mormons. They, they both produce competent individuals. They seem like they're going to be major players in the future of humanity. And theologically, I think they both have a claim to being total and complete revelations from God. Hmm. Jews, because, well, pretty much every group in the Judeo-Christian tree says that Jewish texts have some real importance or weight to them, which is not something we can say for virtually any other religious system. In addition to that, it's a religion that seems to be able to continue evolving and continue updating itself. And as you know, as we think, we don't think any religion that is ever frozen in time or any theological structure that's ever frozen in time can be theologically correct as it would be impossible for God to give a full revelation to people you know, early, early, early in human history. And yet it would be capricious and evil for him to give those people no revelation at all. So when we're looking for a true religion, we're looking for an evolving religious system. With Mormons, it's because they believe that they can continue to get revelations up to today, and they don't really take super hard stances on almost anything in terms of a metaphysical understanding of the universe because of this continued revelation framework, which really fits with our framework for how we think things likely actually work theologically. So when I'm looking at those two groups, Jews just seem to have their act together a lot more right now. Yeah, I, mean, I would say they are an appreciating asset showing signs of like, these guys are doing some appreciation. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what people need to be asking themselves. And I, again, I want to emphasize how meaningful your observation is that like the de facto option that hardline conservative religious families are giving to their kids are either follow our specific religion or join the progressive urban monoculture. Yeah. Like, and like, if you really care about your children's mental well being, thriving as humans, like both like economic, social, and mental and spiritual well being, do you really want their other option to be completely like religiously, morally, like mentally bankrupt? Or do you want to like at least give them a shot at thriving? Yeah, well, and so an interesting thing is a lot of people will see what we're doing and they'll be like, yeah, but even if you send them to like Chabad summer camps and stuff like that, even uh -huh. if you do the Jewish, 
they're never going to be full like ultra orthodox Jews, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's the point. The idea here is not that if they don't like what we're doing, they convert to ultra orthodox Judaism. They convert to some form of like modern orthodox Judaism. You know, they they maybe follow the traditions, but they do not play in the ultra orthodox status games. Which are involved around, you know, having to study all the time. Like they really require a level of an investment that you need to be committed to 100% from birth and not birth, but you know, young team. It would be really right? hard. Yeah. It would be very, very hard for, an it's outsider. like joining the Olympics, but like starting to to train for it when you're in late high school. Like it's Yeah. And like joining a group of like, you know, Russian Olympic gymnasts who've been like training since, you know, but exposing them to that community. So long as they like that community, then they go down the regular Orthodox pathway within Judaism mm -hmm. or, you know, we would call like secular Orthodox Judaism, particularly the one in the U S or Israel, which mm -hmm. gives them a network of spouses, which gives them a network of business partners, you know, people that are willing to help them and everything like that. So yeah. of course we're providing them with, with an advantage there if, if they decide to take that path, but, what we're also trying to do and and you know we have our lifetimes to do this is to for our own weird philosophical and religious framework that we're building up is to build enough of a community of disparate groups that are vaguely connected with this that they also if they go that route have a network where they can get spouses business connections everything like that like we basically have our lifetimes to try to build a network that competes with Judaism for business connection, spousal attainment, and moral, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like a moral spine. And a lot of people can be like, that is a fool's errand to attempt that. That is the sign of grandiose fantasy to think that you could do that. And yet I think that we are well on our way. And we're and not cowards. Also, we strongly believe in, in the power that competition has to enable you to achieve things you never thought you could achieve and the the power of exposure to extremely accomplished peers if you raise a kid surrounded by very accomplished friends and peers they're going to ultimately i think end up even if they like just are lower caliber in general they're going to end up higher than if they were with peers of their own level you know like we're still sharpening ourselves here yeah, no, I and mean, we've worked really hard to do this to ensure that even at a young age, the families that they are socializing with are the, you know, one was in our cultural network and two, like absolutely impressive and setting their expectations really, really high in terms of what's expected of them. And it's showing up already. <laughs> in what way? I'm just like in the confidence that our kids show about their convictions and their judgments. <laughs> Well, this also comes from how we raise them in our parenting style, this idea yeah. of stroking their will rather than breaking their will. Everything about our parenting style is meant to increase the strength of their will. Like that is the core thing that we can do. And I, I think that that's the core thing that we should focus on when they disagree with us or something like that. The last thing I want to do is to break them like a wild horse, right? You want to make it difficult for them you want to strengthen them you don't want them to just be able to do whatever they want like a spoiled brat you want them to understand the moral responsibility of being somebody who lives by their own will mm -hmm. while also strengthening and testing that will as much as possible to make it as strong as possible and and that's something that we you know are consistently focused on within our parenting techniques mm -hmm. but i also want to be clear that we may fail and the best backup network we see right now in the world is the Jewish community. Like, I think pretty obviously. And I think for a lot of people, if, if they were like, okay, if my kids weren't of my culture and I had to choose one other culture as a backup culture and I was accepted by that culture, who are you going to choose? Mormons are a close second, I'd say. Like, I really like the Mormon community. Yeah, um, same. But their fertility rates are falling and they're the, the, the thing that most distances me from the mormon community is when they're overly nice like that just doesn't follow my my no see, that's my bigger problem with it actually is that like most of the mormon content that i get that even makes me love the church is from people who have left the church and are very openly publicly salty about it like it's it's bad if your major like online brand ambassadors are your detractors so 
what we mean by this is when we want to intellectually engage with a community, that means we want to see people from within that community, you know, nitpick every little nuance in terms of how different groups of that community are different, how different people in the community see things differently, and all of the theological debates within the community, what they don't like about the community, what they do like within the community. Now, you can understand, this is something we get in spades within the Jewish community, but almost not at all within the Mormon community, which makes it very dispositionally hard for us to engage with the community outside of people who have left the community and are willing to, like, drop the T. Well, the best brand ambassadors, because I think culturally, when somebody is raised within the Mormon community, they're typically very good at social things. If you look at, like, the leaders of, like, the New Aces community, they're really disproportionately ex um, Yeah, and well, and I think, I think maybe the problem is that there are also many practicing Mormon influencers but they don't, you don't realize they're not talking about their religion. No, I don't think that's it. It's that they don't engage with metaphysical debates as much as I would find like mentally stimulating to me. Yeah. Like to me, the, they, the Mormons have a sophisticated metaphysical system, which is interesting to me. And we've talked about this in our Mormon video, but there is a denial within the Mormon community of the diversity of beliefs within the Mormon community. Mm -hmm. And that denial makes interesting debate within, within the community, at least from the perspective of an outsider, much rarer than it is within the ultra Orthodox Jewish community where like metaphysical debate is the core of the community, like the mm. absolute core of the community, which is going to engender me like, or the next iteration of me probably more to that community if I'm trying to build an alternative to them. And if you're here as an outsider thinking like, yeah, but you should be choosing which religion you want at the back of religion just based on which one is most likely to be true, you've got to see our video on the Tesseract God concept. Uh, we believe some, not all, but some of the Judeo-Christian tree of revelations to be holy and complete revelations. Uh, that are simultaneously 100% true. And if you follow a conservative interpretation of those traditions, you are following God's will for you. And now, you know, people would be like, yeah, but aren't you worried that your kids might be studying, like, religious texts by studying Jewish texts that are antithetical to your belief system? And it's like, no, because of the way we view these different religious systems, one of our kids studying Jewish texts are studying like real non-heretical information um, in the same way I think most Christian groups would feel the same way about Jewish texts. And the second is, is, is if Mormons had successfully created a Deseret state or a, a strong Deseret isolated community, I would be much more like considering Mormonism as, as the alternative we raise our kids with, mm. but they haven't done that. There is no Mormon Israel yet. Oh, uh. And I think that's very, very important, having these sort of isolated communities where the world's headed, where we're looking at this vast economic collapse and the primary asset in the future being high fertility, high competence, high agency groups. You're just not seeing that. The Mormons have the potential to create something like that. Like, it's very obviously in the DNA of Mormonism to attempt to do something like that, as that was very much how they were founded. They just need to move back in that direction, maybe create a settlement somewhere else, maybe somewhere outside the U.S. Catholics could as well, but they'd have to create some sort of a new exclusive order that allowed priests to breed, and that's unlikely. I, I could see Catholics creating, like, isolated communities in the U.S. that do this that could be very interesting. There I just may kind already of be yet. some that we just don't know about. Yeah, there already might be some that we just don't know about that, that could be interesting to look at. Would it not be fascinating if a Catholic group converted some of these, you know, you increasingly see these old monasteries getting abandoned or sold off by the church, converted one of these into a residential child-focused community? That would be that would be interesting. Same with, same with Orthodox communities. Although Orthodox are just getting absolutely rammed right now. Due yeah, to you don't hear about them Russia. thriving a lot right now. I like mean, they do other. well in the United States, but they don't have awesome fertility rates. And they haven't done a good job of maintaining intergenerational fidelity. And by that, what I mean is they, they have a really high bleed rate. Like they do not keep people in their religion at high rates. After Mormons, probably the next group I would choose for our kids, if I had to choose a group, would be some form of Anabaptists.
Mennonites. Interesting. Probably. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, yeah, yeah. Mennonites. Mennonites are super cool. They're great. I like, yeah. like, like out of all of the groups, I feel some like cultural distance when I engage with the Orthodox Jewish community. I'm like, yeah, I can see that like we get along. I can see like why my ancestors did business because typically Calvinists traditionally did a lot of business with the Jewish community. That was mm -hmm. even my grandfather, like he was a big advocate for the community. And like, it's something that just they're known for you know well your great 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 uncle george washington you know when he took over the country he he did a lot of stuff with the community so it's, it's a really well-known thing that they engaged really heavily with the community but they they still feel different from me and mormons still feel different from me they're they're a little too kind-hearted and yeah, not I'm all Mormon. up in their world yeah. perspective in a way that just doesn't fit with my world. And you'll see this in this big debate, with not debate, but like conversation we have with like Carl Youngbud and the other transhumanist Mormons is, is there, you know, they're unwilling to see, for example, God as an uncompassionate entity. Whereas <laughs> from our perspective, God is just so obviously not compassionate. Like yeah. it is not, unless you define good as the thing that, that God does, God is a, a moral entity from the perspective of our existing humanity. Um, oh yeah, man. I'm going through the old Testament again. And it's like, oh, whoa. I mean, like humans aren't great either, but like, oh, but that's just God made man in his own image. Judging him by these standards. But when you mm. use words like compassion or love to describe God, mm. from my perspective, you are miss. You, you are manipulating people, intentionally manipulating people because you exp you you mean words differently than what humans mean when they say compassion or love. Yes. Well, yeah. It, yeah, because I think when we were speaking that, with... Why aren't you just saying, a, you know, like an unknowable, unknown thing that we can't even begin to comprehend its, moral, its morality or its moral core? But well, um, I, think, I think Lincoln and Carl were, when we were discussing this with them, like they're mormon definition of compassion was oh but god is giving humans the, the potential and the opportunity to achieve so much more and that was their definition of compassion rather than like look at all the suffering that god is permitting it was more right. like yeah 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 god allows us to improve through yeah. suffering and that through, is compassion but we what don't is red and in, in tooth and claw like yeah. through death and intergenerational improvement and 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 horrifying horrifying means right you know i look at nature i look at this idea of red and tooth and claw and i think that that is the 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 gift that god has given us that allows us to improve which is the ability to suffer and die and improve intergenerationally but that is not like from the perspective of the zebra that's being eaten alive by a lion or something or eaten alive by a bear to bears eat alive more lions don't eat alive a lot but the deer that's being eaten alive by a bear or the human the human child that's being eaten alive by a bear because that has happened many times that does not seem like what i consider compassion from a human perspective and i think this is where we differ most from them because within the, the calvinist framework you're not going to be like god is compassionate in the way that humans use the word compassion no fucking right <laughs> um but Mennonites, when I talk with Mennonites, I really get them. Like, they just seem culturally very, very, very close to me. I feel almost no difference between myself as Mennonites or even Amish. And and they're they're in our local communities and stuff like that. I, I remember, you know, I was watching a video, a great video of, of, of Amish people talking about it. And they were bitching about the money they got from the government for having additional kids. Oh. And they were like, oh, there's these child subsidies. And it's disgusting that the government is giving us money for this. But I've, I mean, of course, we're going to take it if they're handing mm. it to us. And I just felt such a, I was like, yes. I really get you guys, you know. But, but you feel like a disconnect between what's going on here and what's going on out there. I would. Mm -hmm. I would too. I, would. Yeah. I definitely yeah. would say so. Okay, so this I'm last not year. I'm troubled by it. No, it's, no, it's a way of life for us. So this last year, COVID, all the craziness that's gone on with the politics. You the not worst even... part of it for us was the annoyance of having Torah mask everywhere. She travels more than I would. I'm happy at home. My husband is very happy at home. And he grew up on a farm. He, we live on a fruit farm. 
and he just likes raising fruit, and that's what he does. He has coming, a really small world. Coming yeah. out here is about as hard as he does. Give him fruit, give him pie. Yeah, <laughs> He's good to go. So I call your attention to a few things in these conversations that I find really interesting. And I would suggest you go check out this guy's channel and his other stuff on Amish and Mennonite communities if you want to experience more of what those communities are like, because he does, I think, a very good job of portraying them. The first is how insularly focused the community is and how they status signal within the community through their humility in terms of how they relate to each other. The way that they are flexing is through humbleness, which is really in accord with the way that we often try to flex. You know, when we're talking about anime or the lower arts, we are doing that to flex how unpretentious we are in the things that we signal liking. The second thing that you see within these communities is while men and women have different roles and systemically different roles based on biological gender differences, women are not treated as lesser than men at all. And this is really interesting, I mean, like, conversationally, ideologically. Like, women may not have a place in the church because of what the Bible says, but in terms of how they're treated in general conversations, there isn't... They, they talk over men, they share their ideas, and their ideas are respected. And this is something that I really notice when I'm around different groups, is the way that they relate between the two genders, and I just find this aligns much more with my cultural heritage and the way that I would want my kids to be treated, you know, a hundred years from now, they end up going down some different cultural pathway. Now, what we're going to go to next is a clip of them talking about technology use, because I think it also shows how clear headed they are. Well, we'll also give you an opportunity to look to see if you can notice some of the things I was just mentioning. So I have a smartphone. Yeah. I do not have a browser on my smartphone. So I have a, I erased the browser and it's intentional. Okay. Um, I took the browser off. I have a smartphone so that I can call and text. Yep. Otherwise, I don't have access. Uh, I've got maps, but I don't have access to the internet on my smartphone. Now, you know, see what he has to say. I talked do about it. In different I ways. talked about it today. Tell us quickly. Okay. So I have a smartphone as well, and I have a blocker on here that blocks all pornographic and all. You know, all of that stuff. Okay. But, and I can customize it to what apps I can have. Like, I would have YouTube. Mm -hmm. I would have that. But then, uh, it's just, it's up to the individual then. And then I have a blocker on here, and we have accountability groups in our church. And I'm accountable to what I use on my phone to two other brother from the church. Okay. What about you, ladies? My I phone. Have, I have the same, I have the same thing Josh has. Mm -hmm. same. Okay. And you're... My phone, I have a flip phone. I'm actually not sure where uh, mine is at. And mine doesn't have any data on it. My husband shut off all the data. And so what I can do with my phone is I can call uh -huh. and I can text. But, like, I cannot receive any pictures or even group messages because all the data is cut off. He shut yours off. Do you shut his off? He did. He <laughs> shut his off, too, yeah. You We're shut... on the same page. So you guys, like, <laughs> regulate each other. No, we don't have any internet access on the phone. So, And we actually don't have any internet at all at our house or anything. You're offline completely. We're offline. By ourselves, we choose to live that way because we enjoy being simple and... I don't know. We see a lot of dangers in it. We see a lot of dangers in having it. So I think that that's, that's where we have the least cultural distance. But the problem is, is that they're not economically productive. And that's really, really important to me in, in being able to join in a high economic productivity group if you're going to be one of the people who gets off planet. Like our mm -hmm. goal for our kids, like if you're like, what are you really aiming for with your kids? Yeah, cultural fidelity is nice, but I want them to be part of that group, part of that movement and in, in, in through we, how we improve them and through how we create this intergenerational improvement, whether that means going to another cultural group or some improved iteration of our own, that is taking to the stars, that is conquering the universe, it is creating the imperial of man, this, this vast human empire. You know, future days coming up and we have these projectors on our ceilings of, of galaxies, right? And we talk about their place in the universe. And when we point to this, we're like, you know, Simba and the, at the beginning of The Lion King, everything you see is, is your domain. Look, Simba, everything the light touches 
is our kingdom. Wow. A king's time as ruler rises and falls like the sun. One day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. And this will all be mine? Everything. Everything the light touches. That's what we're doing when we are engaging them with this galaxy. This galaxy that you see, you know, in, in some future days we're going to take them talking to Simone about this to the woods so they can see the the stars you know they can see all the the stars in the sky this the is the vastness of the universe this is for you to conquer this is your domain this is your <laughs> manifest destiny this was given to you by god as something that that is your duty and your responsibility to make humanities and that that is a a deeply vast and, and should be humbling responsibility. And, and you are starting so early, you know, we haven't even conquered one planet yet. You know, we are starting so early in this cycle, but I hope that they play a role in, in that vast future for humanity. And if we unfortunately use Mennonites as our backup culture, very <laughs> unlikely that that's going to happen. Mm, no. Well, I, I think we're like very, very clearly, too technophilic to ever really pass. As Although there could is. be an interesting version of like AI safety Mennonitism. What do you mean? Uh, well, they never develop. They basically freeze civilizational development at our current stage. Oh. Instead of at another stage, then they they kill everyone else and they ensure that we never develop AI any further. And they're just like, right now, this is when we need to stop. Like for them, it was buttons. For Eliezer Yukowski, it's AI. It's, it's one of the oh, things interesting. Out there, that famous Douglas Adams quote, you know, the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that was so prophetic that the moment when the average member of the EA community turned over 30, or it wouldn't even say the average leading member, like basically as soon as Ellie Eiser turned over 30, the EA move became rabidly a Luddite cult. And what he said is anything invented after the age of 30 for you is is wrong and must be destroyed, right? Like that's how humans relate to technology. And I'll put the, the full quote on the screen here because it's brilliant that he had this insight. Yeah. Uh, he said anything that's invented between when you're born and when you turn 30, that's that's like something you're going to get a job in. That's interesting technology. And isn't that what they were with crypto and stuff like that? They loved all that. But then they're like, but, but anything after I'm 30 is like a an abomination and must be destroyed. So, you know, you could see something like that. But no, I, I, I think the reality is, is that our best shot with AI is to merge with AI to, to do what humanity has always done, which is to be a merger of the biological and synthetic. When I say merge, I do not be downloaded into AI. I mean, uh, upgrade themselves with AI and technology and continue to advance as a species until in the words of Winwood Reed, we as, as, as humans can become something that if explained to us today, we would not understand in the same way that if we explained electricity to the the savage, they would not understand um, that we will become you, you pure radiant beings of which now we cannot even conceive, which is, you know, what we see as the, the agents of providence within our religious system. But this is why we raise our kids partially Jewish. It's just the one, the best bet. And two, I think one of the most logically consistent religious frameworks. Well, but also like healthy. If we want to give our kids the best shot in life, it, you know, you want to look at yeah. religious traditions that have favorable outcomes. And, and Christians will say things like, well, yeah, but Jews predicted a future Messiah, which then was clearly happened. Like they predicted a future prophet, which then clearly happened and they ignored. And then I'd say, yeah. Yes, and if you read the Christian Bible, it also clearly predicts future prophets, um, <laughs> which you have ignored. So I, you know, if I'm going to be like, let's go back to one of these systems of ignoring future prophets. Okay, we'll go to the Jewish system. Basically, we're taking the position that the Judeo-Christian tree is almost certainly the correct one. And if it isn't the correct one, then why did God allow the timeline to play out as it played out? You know, if he's from one of the other traditions, he really messed up with this planet. So if we take the position that Judeo-Christian tradition is the correct tradition, we can either say, okay, we accept no additional prophets. They're, they're just no prophets, only the legalistic system and the community. And the way that legalistic system and community evolve in a secular context is God's will and God's revelation, in which case we are Jewish, 
or we take all additional profits, in which case we're in our position. Another huge advantage of Judaism from our perspective is it gets around the problem that we keep mentioning of why would God give a revelation that is meant for everyone to people in one isolated part of the world and not allow that message which is required for salvation to not reach most of the world for a thousand years or so. You know, Jesus is in historic Israel, and yet that message can't reach the Americas for about a millennium. That strikes me as logically inconsistent to the level where I would have trouble convincing my kids of this. However, with Judaism, I don't have the same problem because Judaism is not all-encompassing. Judaism doesn't say, oh, this message is meant for everyone. It says, oh, it's meant for this specific population group, which fixes this hole in the logic when I'm trying to convince my kids of this system. Another advantage here is the good and evil problem. Judaism, at least the Old Testament God, is a God that is very clearly not a good entity from the perspective of people living today. It's only a good entity insofar as you define everything done by God as good. And I think that that's also a much more e easy and realistic God to convince kids of than a all-powerful, all-good entity actually created the world that we live in today. There is suffering to exist that no positives come out of. And I think it's, it's pretty objectively true that that type of suffering does exist in the world we live in. And this is one of the problems that we had when we were in the uh, debate with the Mormon transhumanists where they're like, well, God is compassionate. And I'm like, very clearly not by what we as humans mean when we say the word compassionate. And they're like, well, that's true. And then it's like, well, then you, why would you even use that word? Why would you even say that if you're just defining compassionate as the things that God does? And here I should note, when I say that God is not good from the way that we, like normal people, define good, I think God is better than that. But I think that that's because the way that we as normal humans define good is bad. And we should study God's will to try to understand it better. And that that will is much more red in tooth and claw than we would pretend in the Kumbaya world. We'll add one more note, though, which is that it's, it's not just that we're only going to expose our children to Jewish traditions. Now, we're not going to go, like, take our kids to, like, Easter Mass or something. Like, we're not going to practice other forms of religion, I think. Unless our kids, like, really want to have a go at it. You know, they're willing to organize the holiday. Yeah, they're like, I'll, I'll handle yeah, all the organization. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the research. I'll have us, you know, I'll redo the recitals or whatever. But we do want our children to be educated in every major religious tradition. We want them to understand the stories, the philosophy they should have read you know, at least excerpts from, I mean, they, I mean, certainly they should have read the whole, like all the New Testament, clearly, but then yeah. also like no excerpts from major religious books from other traditions as well. And also understand like the moral and metaphysical frameworks of these other religions. And so, you know, we're, we're, I think it's also important for that to be made clear because otherwise it just seems like, well, oh, I, they're just going to like do... Judaism, maybe. Yeah, but I, I also say, stuff. like, when it comes to that, if you look at the skill tree we're building out in our, our education system, you know, one religion we focus a lot on within it is Islam. But I think today a lot of people are really sleeping on Islam hmm. as a religious tradition because, and we'll do another video talking about this, but if you look at Muslims today, you're essentially looking at what would be the equivalent of, you know, Europeans in the Dark Age. You are looking at a collapsed former empire. You, we right now are in the Muslim Dark Age. They had a, a, a shining empire that was so magnificent that when Europeans would write books on chemistry or physics, they would write them under fake Muslim-sounding pseudonyms because nothing else was taken seriously in the world of activity. <laughs> that is how dominant they were as intellectuals, as people moving civilization forwards during their bright period. Hmm. But they just flamed out more recently and are right now in a dark age, which leads to many people looking at them and looking... And I will agree with this. You know, in, in our show, we're often like, when we talk about the future enemies of prenatalism, we talk about you you have right now the urban monoculture but you also have groups that are antagonistic to anyone other than them existing in the world right? right and a lot of these groups right now like the most populous of these groups in terms of fertility rates right now in the world or not even fertility rates just total population right now are some muslim groups 
but these these groups they do not represent what is actually in the Quran, hmm. and and then a lot of people are like, well, we need to be antagonistic. I'm like, even like Jews, right? Like Jews need to understand that the United States is withdrawing from the Middle East. The Middle East is no longer relevant to the United States. Yeah. That means your future key allies are going to be Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They're going to be Muslim groups. Okay, so 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 be aware that a lot of these mindsets we have towards Muslims today are going to need to evolve and really understand that there are multiple groups that wear the mask of Islam. Yeah, when you have to look at is monsters where it doesn't mean that everyone who wears it is the monster. One hundred percent. Or they're not sophisticated. The questions to ask also when looking at like not just which groups will be present in the future, but which groups will have power in the future is who is able to maintain at least a stable or ideally higher birth rate and is technophilic. So I think what the problem is, is a lot of people are looking at <clears throat> really high birth rate groups from many different ethnic and religious traditions. And they're like, oh my God, look, they're like reproducing like crazy. They're going to be the only people in the future. But these people are not employed. These people are not very educated. These people are committing a lot of crime. These people are like basically like they are anti-society agents and they are not going to build. They're only going to destroy at their like current societal trends. Mm -hmm. So what you need to look at is any groups that are building, that are both having kids and contributing to culture, following and creating laws, designing things, building enterprises, building businesses. And, and those, yeah, totally the ones to watch and the ones to ally with. Well, to use as backups. And I think this all comes down to something from our cultural group's perspective, which is for your kids, if you're of a conservative tradition, I would have a backup tradition for your kids. Hmm. And so you might think all of our religious nonsense here, if you're like, actually, that kind of sounds like a good idea, this no. future day stuff and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that could make for a good backup tradition for you <laughs> in terms of at least- This is like a, a why not Zoidberg moment. Yeah, um, at least having a, a, a backup that's not the urban monoculture. No. Well. No, but seriously, I actually, we, we are beginning to celebrate- really seriously for the first time because our kids can get it one of our major holidays biggest holiday our, our religion's biggest like the holiday. biggest one future day i mean like i'm really excited to celebrate lemon week this year too but yeah, like yeah. yeah future day is like the one we splurged on the decor we're getting our like our kids ramped up for it we're, we're starting the music and the movies and like it's you know it's a fun religion so <laughs> Just well, saying. there's not many other religions you get Terminator as a holiday movie and stuff. Well, like there's that. not many religions that get that got to like develop holiday decorations in a post like projector, post Tesla coil world. So <laughs> <laughs> it's also kind of cool. I uh, love it. I love, yeah, it. I love it. Yeah. And I love well, I, and I love you. And I really am blessed. And if you talk about the agents of Providence, that I happened to marry somebody who somehow let me into the Jewish cultural club. Oh, yeah. Um, Without knowing it, because I didn't know that rule existed. But and you, Yeah, and, and you didn't particularly care or identify with the group when I met you. I probably cared more about Judaism than you did. I was like, oh, cool, cheat code. And you were like, oh. So so I, I, I think that these things are... Interesting. Another way to think about why we raise our kids with a backup culture is somebody can look at everything we're doing, you know, especially given all the work we're putting into like building up this religious and cultural system for our kids and think, oh, that must mean that they really want the kids to feel indebted, like they're definitely going to pick this up because of all the work and sacrifice that we've put into this, when if anything, it's quite the opposite. I mean, it's doing something quite cruel to a kid to be putting them and raising them in a new cultural group that you have created yourself and raise them feeling like you won't appreciate them if they do anything other than this really insane, weird thing you set up for them. It would be... I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's obviously a, would be a cruel thing to do to our kids. So to give them another option outside of just the urban monoculture that they feel that they were to some extent raised within is very important to us. Another thing I'd, I'd add to the end of this for any of our listeners who are interested is the school system that we're developing is about to reach a next critical stage. 
any of you who are open to helping with it, reviewing it, right now what we really need is eyes on the big skill tree that we've built. So if you have domain expertise in any area, like physics, chemistry, something like that, and you could review a skill tree, like think of a video game skill tree and be like, is this an accurate representation of how I would build this out for my field of domain expertise? But, you know, do email us, let us know, and we will talk to you guys and send you a copy and you can be like, hey, this is how I change this. This is how I change this. Because that could, that could help us a lot in making this as high quality as possible. You know, when I when this launches, I want this to be a full skill tree, basically, of all human knowledge. It's uh, already so cool, you guys. Like, I'm in, insanely proud of what Malcolm has put together. And I don't think, you know, I mean, you've, you are combining an incredibly sweeping knowledge base on your own personal front with the help of AI, which has yeah. just, like, super powered this in a way where it gets me really excited about... I want to go through it personally because it the most important thing about the skill tree isn't like the knowns that it will show you like you're like oh grammar and english is there but like the unknowns you're like wait i didn't even know i could learn this what is this this is insane like and and school i'm learning schools universities even the very best the most elite institutions the most big institutions do not have the capacity to teach you everything. They just don't have, they don't have the money well, or the space. Like, oh, oh, here's the course on aquaculture pharmacology, you know? Yeah, like, like this, I mean, or, and or I'm sure there, there are like three universities work. that have good programs for that. But like, you know, usually you don't have access to that. Mm -hmm. And this is like, oh, game changer. So guys, you have to reach out to Malcolm about this because it's kind of a big deal. Um, it, it, we do look at the comments and we try to read try, all of but i do you know? i we, we do always go through the comments and we really appreciate it and we feel like we do have a personal relationship with our with our fans that is much stronger than the personal relationship we have with our fans friends because you guys <laughs> don't force us to meet you or talk to you like oh my god what a blessing what a blessing to have a friend that is i don't need to talk to or meet with but is like intelligent and well considered and often says nice things to it me. does get even better when we get to meet them though like we've met some of the, some of you who are watching we've met in person hey guys and it's been really great to meet you and i'm looking forward to meeting to meeting i weirdly because i don't i hate meeting people in person but somehow like the people who watch our podcast are really cool <laughs> at least someone's capable of also meeting in person i guess so yeah anyway thanks to all of you for watching but I'm also extremely glad to be hidden away in our little farmhouse just with you, Malcolm. You're my number one main squeeze. And I, I love you too. Love you. And, and the, it's funny. One of the things that Simone has always said that has made her most resistant to joining is these religious communities is having to engage with other people. Oh. I mean, if our kids are as autistic as us, they'll just be like, screw all other people. I um, mean, just, you know, one of the things we're going to do for our kids, like if you guys are like, well, what would it look like to be like ancillarily flirting with this cultural group for our kids we'll probably be putting together like some sort of a summer camp for kids mm -hmm. so that our kids can meet other people so that well and eventually i think we're going to do like a an illustrated like holiday book with weird holidays so you know we're and, like we're going to outline stuff like there will be you know if you want to understand our holidays and what we do we will eventually provide materials but we're play testing first okay gotta get play testing perfect. Yeah. Speaking of which, we need to return to our movie lineup for future day. We're going to continue watching Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, so let's. I love you to death, Simone. You are the it. best wife that anyone could ever hope for. And you clearly were meant for me because I don't think anyone else would tolerate you. I, I, I don't think anyone true, else would tolerate me. Like we are so uniquely like just love everything that's weird about each other. Well, but you here's know? the thing. You made me into who I am, but also that person was who I wanted to be. I'm your Pygmalion, but I wanted to be that person. So thank you for that. Thank you for making everything so perfect and wonderful. And I love you. Let me go get love you a too. hug. <laughs> like a uh, weird, if you die, one of our friend's wife died recently. I don't know. Which breaks my heart. I mean, we'd probably, I'd go to the channel and be like, oops, looking for a husband. And it's okay with like four or five kids <laughs> from another wife because I'm not going to go out there and date again. Fuck that. Good luck. But I also don't want my kids to grow up without a mom. Oh. Well, okay. So I'll don't die. die. So be careful. This is why I always put you in the safe car. This is why I'm always, you know, even when it I takes need my to dad. be a little less clumsy. So let's.
You promise to not carry so much when you go up and down the stairs? Ugh, but there's so much to carry. Just give it to me. I'll handle it. All right, thanks. I love you, Malcolm. I love you too. You're so sweet to me. He's got it, buddy. <laughs>